No? <laughs> okay, good to go. So how many of you have noticed that we have a national quantum initiative that was signed by our president uh, at the end of last year? How many of you are aware of it? Okay, do you guys know what is the implication of it? Where is the money going to go? Quantum computing, topological materials, fast switches and things like this. So that's the motivation of my talk. There are many things that appear in the literature these days. I chose a few things to share with you. We'll see how time goes. If I don't have time to show everything, forgive me. There's too many things going on. Also, these papers uh, have a lot of material, a lot of supplementary information. We'll give you a superficial overview, okay? So we're going to talk about novel transport phenomena and a few other things I have learned is, is a biased uh, overview of, of uh, an experimentalist. So we're trying to talk about a few relevant concepts. Maybe we'll go very fast because uh, <coughs> we have already Jennifer and Stratus have done a lot of introductions. So I don't have to talk too much about Barry curvature or, or Barry connection vector or Barry vector potential. So we'll talk about a few relevant concepts. We'll discuss a little bit about vials and metals and novel transport properties, what I mean by that. And if you there time, this time we'll go back to vial types, two and metals. So before I go there, we are the high magnetic field lab. So this lab is heavily involved with the, all this research. And the one of the reasons we're heavily involved is because we can measure things like Fermi surfaces. So I'm assuming all of you know what a Fermi surface is, right? There are a lot of faces staring at me, not very sure. So is this locus and case space that separates empty uh, electronic states and filled electronic states? It creates a surface of constant energy, which is an energy of the Fermi level. Oops. So while we measure Fermi surface in high magnetic fields, that's what I talked to you about this. It's very simple. Uh, you have a magnetic field, the magnetic field is going to bend the electronic orbits, this affects the kinetic energy. When you put the vector potential within the Hamiltonian, at range terms, you're left with this Hamiltonian, which is nothing else than harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian. It means you have cyclotronic motion in the plane perpendicular to the field, and you have free dispersion along the field direction, okay? So the solutions of this Hamiltonian is this. You have quantized levels, the so-called lambda levels, and the separation between lambda levels is proportional to the magnetic field. Here you have omega c, cyclotron energy, which is the relation charge and mass times magnetic field. So as the magnetic field increases, the separation between lambda levels increase, okay? So normally, all your cares in these lambda levels, if you plot the density of states as a function of energy, you have Dirac deltas, and the, all your electrons in these Dirac deltas for your del density of states. In reality, your material has impurities, your material has phonons, and these Dirac deltas are broadened up, and you, you end up with Lorentzians, okay? So what happens when you ap apply a magnetic field? Well, you separate these lambda levels, and they eventually cross the Fermi level. And what happens when they cross the Fermi level? Every physical variable that depends on the density of states will start to oscillate. And this is an example, the strong serotonate. And this Fermi surface was extracted from measurements like this. It's just magnetization as a function of magnetic field. As you can see, there are a lot of wiggles. It is just the, your lambda levels crossing the Fermi level. You, if you have more density of states, you have more spins. If you respond to the magnetic field, this typically changes. If you have larger density of states, when the Fermi level, uh, lambda level crosses the Fermi level, you have more electrons to carry electricity. You can see a dip in the resistivity, okay? These things are actually periodic one or a field. If you plot these wiggles, the function of one or a field, and you take the Fourier transform, you'll see uh, several frequencies. And there's something that I'm going to talk in a minute, is the Onzaga relation that relates the cross-sectional area of the Fermi surface maxima and minima to this frequency. So you can relate, as was done with Christoph Bergman, oops. Uh, ah, some of this, uh, sorry, it's not working very well. So you can relate some of these frequencies to specific cross-sectional areas. And actually, if you analyze this very carefully, you can analyze the corrugation of the Fermi surface. Again, this picture from Strosser Rutenate was completely taken from one trace like this. So you can know the Fermi surface is cylindrical. You can know the very much details of geometry of the Fermi surface. Before I move, um, well, assuming, oh, I don't know what's happening with this. 
perhaps it's my PowerPoint is doing something funny. Sorry. No, that's okay. So simplest thermosurface of sodium is a spherical. 2D thermosurface is like a strong serotonate. What does it mean? Does anybody understand what 2D thermosurface means? Basically what you have is carriers are well localized in a plane. So incertitude in principle means that you have a lot of uncertainty on the momentum in the direction perpendicular to the plane. So in the plane you have KF and that draws you a circular thermosurface because of the incertitude this gives you a cylinder. So layer materials tend to give you cylindrical fermi surfaces. And if you have a tight binding, some coupling between the planes, this will induce corrugations on the fermi surface. And it's important to know the geometry of fermi surface. The cuprate, the rutinates, and many oxides have two dimensional fermi surfaces. And the geometry of the fermi surface is going to give you defined separate parameters like the symmetry of the superconducting <laughs> gap if it's a single superconducting. Okay? So by just knowing the geometry of the fermi surface, you can infer a lot of properties on the material befo before even doing calculations. If you have a quasi 1D system, let's say organics, materials composed of chains, you have just two Fermi points, minus and plus KF, which in certitude principles, you have planes of K, right? The, the, mom the momentum is very well defined in, the pl in a specific chain. So if it creates Fermi surface which are just parallel planes. If you have some corrugation, because of tight binding term, the actual Fermi surface will look like this, which is the Fermi surface of TMTSF2 PF6, an organic compound. And that Fermi surface is interesting because it's a wave vector Q that connects the two Fermi surfaces. And that tells you the electrons in this Fermi surface will like to pair with the holes in the other Fermi surface and give you something that's called bond, bond order. Could it be spin-dust waves or charge-dust waves? Okay, now we know what a Fermi surface is, geometry, yeah. I would just have to go very quickly through this. Um, why stream of cross-sectional areas that we measure through quantum oscillations? Um, when the electrons go through a cyclotronic orbit, they have to enclose a integral number of quantum flux, okay? When increase the magnetic field, they have to still go around in a, and enclose a, an, an integral number of quantum flux. So basically, as I said before, you have a quantized moment. This is a Fermi surface. You have a quantized moment perpendicular to the magnetic field. The longer the magnetic field have any value of momentum. So this forms Landau tubes. Your Fermi surface is modifying the magnetic field into Landau tubes. And these Landau tubes actually exit the Fermi surface if you increase the magnetic field. Others form at the edge of the Fermi surface and drive out of the Fermi surface. And this topological changes of the Fermi surface is what well, drives all these oscillations uh, that you measure in physical quantities. That's why what you actually measure is this topological changes of the Fermi surface. What you measure is the cross-sectional areas of the Fermi surface. And that's what exactly the Onzaga relation tried to uh, convey. So there is a formalism that uh, explains the quantum oscillatory phenomena. I'm not going to go into details. I'm just trying to make a few points here, okay? Especially because in a high magnetic field. So there's a so-called lipschitz kozlovich formalism, which is something old, that explains the behavior of the quantum oscillations, these wiggles. So the oscillatory in a certain frequency in, as a function inverse field. So if you measure the amplitude as a function of a temperature, you can extract the effective mass. There's some, something in this expression here, which is the temperature damping factor. As you increase the temperature, the Fermi distribution function widens, and the, the, all these quantization conditions tend to be wiped out by phonons. So that's described by this. There's another effect which has to do with impurities. If you have impurities, you have to go to higher and higher fields to see quantum oscillations. And they grow quite quickly. This is called the Dingle term. And Dingle term is associated with the uh, so-called um, quantum lifetime of the quasi-particle. So you can measure the quantum lifetime by looking on how the, these uh, oscillations grow with the magnetic field. And this, uh, f this um, quantum oscillatory phenomena are also susceptible to the spin on the Fermi surface. You can, you, when you apply magnetic field, you have a German effect, a spin up, a spin down Fermi surface. And it can be such that the Fermi, once the Fermi surface grows, the other shrink, the one that has spin up grows, the other one has spin down shrink, and they can uh, somehow get out of phase, and, get, and when they're out of phase, they cancel out, they have something that's called the spin zeros. The amplitude dies at a specific point. Happens every time this thing here is a multiple pi over two. And for this information, you can extract, for example, the G factor. And the G factor tends to be renormalized. So this is a way 
to measure correlation. You can instruct effective masses, you can instruct the defect if they're much more larger than one, in this case, effective mass, and G much larger than two. You know the electronic correlations, spin out a couple of other things that play an important role in your system. So that's why we do this kind of measurements here. Now, yes? Yes, it's usually assumed to be parabolic bands, okay? And this is a very good question because there are people saying the Lipschitz cause of its formulas may not be appropriate for topological materials with uh, linearly dispersing bands, but nobody has come up with an alternative model, okay? I know people that work on this, this precise model, okay? Yes, yeah, for multiband. I mean, that's why you have multiple frequencies here. For every piece of Fermi surface, uh, just a second. Sorry, for every piece of Fermi surface, you have one of these sinusoidal terms. Okay? Actually, a, a Fermi surface is usually corrugated. You have minimum and maximum cross-section area, so you actually spec, not necessarily, but you actually spec to see at least two frequencies for each piece of Fermi surface, okay? So there's another point that's important about the quantum oscillations. Uh, it is lipschitz kozovich formulas. There's a, a phase term here, okay? And this has been used heavily to try to determine if a material is topological or not. This is a one-half term that's a standard lipschitz kozovich This is a delta term that depends on the Fermi surface being 3D or being 2D. This 3D, this term here is 1 8 multiplied by 2 pi or pi over plus minus pi over 4. And uh, the plus or minus depends if it's maximum, minimum, cross-sectional area, the electrons or holes, et cetera. But it essentially 3D Fermi surfaces. This 5D here is the Berry phase. So in graphene, the Berry phase is pi or 1 half here cancels this term and this term is supposed to be zero. And this was measured in this very famous nature paper by Philip Kim. It became sort of the standard. You know, in graphene you have quantum hall. So the quantum hall plateaus, you know the N indexes or the chair numbers very precisely. And you can see the magnetic resistance when you're in a hall plateau, right, the hall plateaus are here, you know exactly the minimum of a conductivity of what hall plateau you are. So you can make what is called a Landau index plot, the, the, the number of your Hall plateau, or your index, one, two, three, and so forth, and plot it as a function of one over field for different gate voltages. And what Philip King found is that this phi B here, that they call beta, <coughs> tends to accumulate around phi over two. Okay? That was presumably demonstrated with graphene if topological has Dirac like dispersion. Notice that it's not perf perfectly. Pi has some deviation, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, close to 0.5, but it clusters around 0.5. So why I'm bringing this up here today? Because graphene is carbon. It has very weak spin of the coupling. But the most materials you're going to measure, especially if they're topological, they have very strong spin of the coupling. They have elements like bismuth, platinum, iridium, which are very heavy. And why is this important? And that's, that's the part I'm trying to convey my personal experience here. Spin of the coupling is very strong. Zeeman effect is very strong. So what happens in that case is that the Fermi surfaces, if they're small, if you have semi-metals, we're going to discuss in a moment, you have a small Fermi surfaces. You have a spin texture in that Fermi surface is defined by spin of the coupling, but the spin of the coupling, the magnetic field is going to couple through the Zeeman effect, the G factor is renormalized. Zeeman effect is large, and that Fermi surface will be slightly modified by the magnetic field or sometimes very severely modified by the magnetic field. So why am I trying to tell you this? Because you find a lot of papers in literature these days claim to extract non-trivial topology from this kind of Landau index. Don't believe them. A few you can, the vast majority no. Because they have to look very carefully. There are very small modifications on the frequencies of this Fermi surface. You try to do a fit to lipschitz kozovich you get different numbers in different ranges of hue. That has been my experience, not for all compounds. But special compounds have small Fermi surfaces and um, strong spin out of coupling. It's my advice. Don't believe on them. You guys do whatever you want. So I'm not going to go into very, very much detail. We already discussed about, about Berry phase. This is a typical example. You go through a sphere and you travel in parallel track. 
along the meridians, along the parallels, and when you go back to your point, this squad here changes the angle, acquires a phase. The curved space actually affects um, your phys final physical condition. Curvature is important. There's no force acting here. All you did, you start, you come back, you acquire an angle. So curvature is an important concept in physics, important concept for the Hamiltonians. Um, let me not go through all this. We already talked about Barry connection vector, Barry curvature, and particularly the so-called Barry uh, vector potential. Mathematically, it looks very much like a magnetic field, the Barry curvature, and it's like an electromagnetic uh, vector potential. It's not accident. The entire point of this is trying to convey that the bend structure of a particular material acts as an effective magnetic field. It's going to bend the trajectories of your electrons in a non-trivial way. Okay? You know that you don't have monopoles of magnetic field. If you have a charge, you build a Gauss surface around it, the flow electric field, you get the charge in the center. If you do the same for magnetic field, then no monopoles, you get nothing. You try to do the same with barrier curvature, that's not true. You may have singularities of barrier phase. Certain points in the Brillouin zone around the main structure create artificial surface, you have a net flow of very curvature, and you calculate that flow, it will give you a chair number in the center. We already talked about this earlier this morning, right? And these are your vial points. And that's the difference. These vial points have been seen by ARPES uh, in several compounds. Here I'm talking about tantalum arsenide in particular. Again, you started with this idea from topological isolators that you have band inversion. In topological isolators, when you put the spin of the coupling, spin of the coupling opens a gap, right? Does everybody understand that? You guys understand what's being open? You have an electron here. It's going around your nucleus. Your nucleus is going around your charge in that reference frame, right? So it seems like an effective magnetic field created by the nucleus. You spin point in that direction. So it's like a Zeeman effect. This places the bands. So it opens a gap and not at the surface. You project the surface, you find the surface states, which are akin to graphene, which in bismuth selenide uh, is supposed to be linearly dispersing. In tantalum arsenide, the gap is not open everywhere. There are several band crossings, and there are several points where you have a linear dispersion like in graphene. And again, as we discussed, if you put, create a surface around here, you get this so-called topological charges by analogy with the electrostatic, with, 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 with the charge that it would get with a real charge. And the projections we already said, since you have a chair number, we said we should have a surface state, and you do have these Fermi arcs, and they are, um, you project your bio points from the bulk to the surface and they connect uh, these uh, surfaces. So there in tantalum arsenide, there are two pairs of bio points, blue and red defined in topological charges. And as you can see, there are different separations, bio one and bio two, some of them and kz equals zero and the other ones in a different plane. So what are the evidence for bio fermions? Oh, and why back? A matter of semantics. In German, it's Hermann Bio. So some people say Bio, and actually the right pronunciation is like Ising and Easing. You should say Easing, not Ising. You should say Bio and not while. I have gone to conference and have people criticize me. This is not American English. I give a damn. This is German. Bio, okay? So I don't want to hear that kind of again. This is not American English. It's not American English. Of course, it's Bio, it's German. So, um, so for people who do ARPES, they do see these arcs. There are several, there are a bunch of papers early on that saw the arcs on the surface of the material. Supposedly they have a non-trivial texture of the berry phase around them. Okay, this is not being very clearly, in my opinion, solved. Another evidence for biophysics is so-called actual anomalies we have discussed. As we said, uh, we have these topological charges with the barrier curvature going in, barrier curvature going out. The electrons around these points have a particular chirality. If you apply a magnetic field, it breaks the symmetry. It has tendency to favor one flavor chirality in detriment of the other. What does it mean? It means tends to transfer carriers, bio carriers from one bio point to the other bio point. It creates what we call an actual current. You're giving large momentum transfer 
from one vial point to the other vial point, to the other chorale. So the next, this extra large momentum transfer, when you have an electric field parallel to the magnetic field, that's important. This extra momentum transfer will contribute to the conductivity. And a manifestation of this is measuring what people have been trying to approach, this is there, is by seeing the conductivity increase in the magnetic field. And to see that, what they try to do is to get rid of the orbital magnetic resistance. If you put the contacts in this way, you have magnetic field perpendicular, you have the orbital magnetic resistance. That, that gives you B squared. So these materials tend to be very clean. This B squared term is very large. So you put your sample this way, current and field are parallel. There's no Lorentz force. So there's no Lorentz force. You don't have the orbital magnetic resistance. Now you measure magnetic resistance. Normally, according to PPAR 50s, you get metal, you get aluminum, all you see is a modest increase of magnetic resistance and saturation. That's what we know. That's what we knew. And here, instead, you see an increase, but it's followed by a decrease in resistivity or increase in magnetic conductivity. This was seen tanto Larsen at the beginning, extremely controversial, and then has been seen in a series of other compounds by Ong and others like sodium bismuth. Parallel conductivity, you see a dramatic decrease in resistivity. And this is taken as evidence for anomalous transport associated with the actual anomaly. Now, that's not the only effect. Um, this is an interesting paper in cadmium arsenide. Cadmium arsenide is not a vial material, it's a Dirac material, in the bulk, a bulk Dirac dispersion. You apply a magnetic field, a spin orbital coupling is going to lift this um, <coughs> Kramer's degeneracy that you have, and then you're going to split the, the linear dispersion and, and make, convert it to a vial dispersion. So what they did is they used focus ion beam and they carved very thin slabs of, uh, of uh, cadmium arsenide. If they are very thin, there's a probability the electron will go from the surface of the other side to this side because just because they are thin. So they can sort of tunnel the material, explore one arc, come back, explore the other arc in a magnetic field. So this has been seen here, uh, actually not necessarily here, between Los Alamos here and and, and Zurich. So normally, this is the frequency that you will see in the bulk for cadmium arsenide, about 37 tesla. When they carve the crystals, there's another frequency that emerges that they claim has to do with the so-called vial orbits. If they carve the crystals in a different way, they, instead of making it um, like a, a rectangular slab, like a triangle, so these orbits do not overlap coherently, and that frequency is gone. So that would be. Do you guys get this? If the, if the surface is parallel, all the carriers crossing the Fermi surface are going to overlap and give you this Y orbit. If it is triangular, the Y orbits have a different lengths and they're not going to overlap coherently, so you're not going to see the, the frequencies associated with this promotion of carriers between Y points exploring. Yes, the surface state. is the separation, yes. Yes, I mean, yeah, well, that's, that's the sketch they, they try to convey, right? But they try, because this Fermi arc to live on the real space, right? That's what you're measuring in R, or in K space if you want to. But basically that's the idea. You have a slab that's very thin, and there's a probability of tunneling and exploring the, uh, the Fermi arcs. It's called a vial orbit. So what don't you understand? Why they're mixing this together? Don't ask me. Write to them and complain about it. Okay. So other manifestations of vial physics. We said already talking about negative minus resistance. We already talking about the vial orbits. What else is there? Well, there are a couple of papers that appeared last year, actually the year before, Burkov and and this guys something called planar hole effect. Uh, it's a prediction if you have the actual anomaly. Normally, f to see a hole effect, you have to have magnetic field perpendicular to the plane, and the Lorentz force is going to deviate the carriers are going to measure voltage. If you have hole contacts and put a field in the plane, you should not see any kind of signal at all. They have predicted that if you actually rotate, you should see a signal that would be sinusoidal, and that the periodicity 
of this sinusoidal signal that's odd in angle and even in field would depend on the tilting of the viacons. If it's not tilted, you should have a, a periodicity of two. I mean, you would have, in 360 degrees, you would see two oscillations. If it's tilted, you would see just one oscillation, okay? This um, planar hall is non magnetic materials. So magnetic materials, basically what you're doing when you're rotating electrons exploring orbits along or perpendicular to, is a ferromagnet, you have domains, you have to go along the domain's wall, domain walls or perpendicular to the domain walls. And this was used in the past to measure the anisotropy of, of uh, resistivity associated with the magnetic materials. It's a very tiny effect. Here the claim is gigantic. Okay? Hold and behold, this is gadolinium bismuth platinum. I'm going to show you why we claim this is a vial semimetal. And this is cadmium arsenide. So if you measure the magnetic resistance, well, you go from a region where you Field and current is parallel, there's no Lorentz force, maximum Lorentz force, zero Lorentz force, maximum Lorentz force, you see a modulation. It's an always an even function of field. If you put contacts, not in a magnetic resistance configuration, but now in a whole configuration, you see a, a, a function that's sinusoidal, has two times the periodicity over 360 degrees, it changes sign, and it's zero when this guy's maximum. So it's not a magnetic resistance, an even function of field and another function of the angle. And it's, it's, it's quite sizable. This is in cadmium arsenide thin films. It is also seen in gadolinium bismuth platinum, although there's some additional complications, probably because of magnetic ordering. So it's a new effect. It's a large effect, and it's claimed to result from the actual anomaly. Now just go back. Why do we believe that gadolinium bismuth platinum and cadmium arsenide are direct cell metals? First, in cadmium arsenide, um, Arcus has seen the linear dispersion very clearly in the system. This is just energy versus K vector in the plane. In uh, Galileo bismuth platinum, Bernadette claimed that the bands that dominated the material is the bismuth 6P bands that have uh, an effective J of three halves. So you have three halves, one half, minus one half, minus three halves. And these different bands would cross when you apply a magnetic field, the system is magnetic, and they would cross in a non-trivial manner. And at this point, so they are crossing in a magnetic field due to Zeeman effect you would generate vial points. So the material becomes vial because it's magnetic in a magnetic field because you're moving the bands, okay? So both guys are, com are candidates for vial cell metal and both of them you see this uh, Hall effect. We have also seen, I don't want to go into too much detail here, but this is data on tantal arsenide. Uh, she on publishes in the archive. So tantal arsenide, uh, we also see a magnetic resistance which is even in angle and field. Here's the planar hall, which is very large multiplied by the thickness of the sample. Superimposed to that, if you look into this data, if you change this all data measurement to resistance configuration, this is data measuring the hall configuration. If when you change from anti resistance to hall, you see a very dramatic asymmetry. There's something else on top of this planar hall, there's something else if you take the difference, it looks like a true hall effect, even when the sample is rotating in the plane that should be a no hole effect. We are not the first ones to see this. Ong just published a Nature Physics. This is zirconium pentatelluride. As you rotate towards the plane, there's this negative magnetic resistance, which was already published in 2016, claiming this was a vial sentimental. If you put the hole effect along the A axis, which is a planar axis, the B axis, the interplanar axis, you see you're in a Hall configuration, presumably the angle is zero, you're along exactly along the A-axis. The Hall effect changes sign. But there's no Hall effect in this configuration. There's no component of the Hall in this configuration. How do you have a Hall effect? Anybody has an idea? So nobody has an idea. He doesn't either. All he says is there's some non-trivial texture of the berry phase that gives you a Hall effect, which is all in angle and all in field, when there's no Lorentz force, okay? This is not the first compound where we have seen this. Recently has been a lot of work and this compound is magnetic. Why is it interesting? First of all, because magnetic, magnetic high temperature, is this foliable down to the monolayer. So for people like me that also work in 3D materials, it's a very interesting material. It orders about 200, depends on the iron content, which is difficult to get stoichiometric. 
but it's somewhere between 220 and 200 Kelvin, the transition temperature towards the ferromagnetic state. Above is just a Pauli, sorry, a Curie paramagnet. It's just a linear, susceptibility is linear in temperature. So if you measure the Hall effect, you measure magnetization, each one, this is the Hall effect, this is magnetization. Magnetization just tracks, aligns the moment, so you have a very large step in the magnetization. If you measure Hall, there's a very large step on the Hall. So the Hall is the anomalous Hall. If you, know, you guys want to know what anomalous Hall is, there's a, pa there's a review paper by Ong, by um, Nagaosa, by Alan McDonough in reviews of modern physics. Going, can, can you explain that this thing is actually associated with the Berry phase? And they're going to talk a little bit about side jumps and skew scattering. You guys can learn all these things there. So this is an anomalous hall, and this guy's here that published the Nature Material last year claim is perhaps the highest ever measured. Large angle, anomalous hall angle, large anomalous hall constant connecting the two. The funny thing though is now you rotate, you put a sample in the, in the, in the plane, right? In this configuration. You measure magnetization. You can see magnetization is very different. You need to go to much higher fields to see saturation. It's much smoother curve. You measure in a hall, you put um, contacts in hall, hold and behold, you see a positive and a negative uh, signal. It changes sign like a hall effect should do. You have a hall effect if you're in the planes. But it does not follow the magnetization. Here is a, is conventional anomalous hall following magnetization. Here does not follow the magnetization. Go it's linear, reaches a maximum, and then tends to break down. So what is going on here? Why do we have a, a strange anomalous hole in this material? So there's these guys here that actually observed this first before us. This is our data. And they claim, well, we have some non-trivial chirality of the spins. You guys are probably going to talk about it later this week, about the magnetic material, spin liquids, and things like this. If you have a non-trivial spin chirality, the electron, uh, the Let's say you have a localized spin with a non coplanar spin texture. The Tirana carrier comes, interacts with non coplanar spin texture, is scattered by its own spin, and does a non trivial trajectory in case space acquires a very phase. This turns out to be wrong. What I claim you have a spin chirality, and then you go align the spins, you go to ferromagnetic phase. This is wrong because according to neutrons, this material has no canting at all. There's no no coplanar spin texture in this material. So to explain the anomalous Hall effect, these guys did very complex band structure calculations. It's DFT plus GMFT. They have put correlations. They have considered the magnetic ordering, things you guys are going to discuss later in this uh, workshop. They see band crossings in certain parts of the Brillouin zone close to the Fermi level. When they put the spin-out coupling, the crossings are gone. You can open a gap. But they claim, for my surprise, it's their claim, that you have a non-trivial berry phase around this point, even if you have a gap denote. What I claim is along the KH, there's a nodal line. It's like Dirac dispersion extending all the way from K to H. But this nodal line is gapped by spin over coupling. Nevertheless, if you put a tube here, a cylinder around this direction, you have, they claim you would get a net flow of berry phase. And that net flow of berry phase is what is going to give you a whole effect even when you should have not had none, okay? In my opinion, what is happening here is that probably a kent in the spins and change the texture of the berry, uh, the berry phase, uh, or the berry curvature. So the fundamental question for me is, is this right? It's published in Nature Material, does it mean it's right? If you have a gap of this, how can you have such dramatic texture of berry phase around there if there are no nodes? I do not know. I'm hoping for one of you to answer this question to me before the end of the week. So we have done other measurements just to compare the anomalous hall with the so-called planar hall. So this is the Zion germanium telluride. First thing you guys are going to notice, this is 250 Kelvin trace here. This is 250 Kelvin trace. In the paramagnetic state, th there's an anomalous hall which is just half of what you see very at low temperatures. It's just a half of the value. And presumably here, you don't have, because you don't have magnetic order, you don't have a non-trivial barrier phase. Why is the Hall effect so large already in the paramagnetic state? So if you go to paramagnetic state, this is, you know, this is raw data, you're just measuring. You see something that looks like um, sinusoidal, like you would expect for a Hall effect, and change the sign when you change the field. If you take the difference, 
you cancel the magnetic resistance component, you have the pure hole component. So low temperatures, this whole anomalous planar hole is there very clearly. When they go very low temperatures, you see a tiny conventional planar hole because of the ferromagnetic state of this material. At high temperatures, this is completely gone. This is the conventional planar hole that has nothing to do, in my opinion, with the actual anomaly, just the fact that the material is magnetic. What is strange is that you still see a planar hole effect above the ordering temperature. Here in the crystal field, you order the temperature, it changes science. So this, a fundamental question we are working on is this already topological in the paramagnetic phase. Am I going too fast? Because everybody's already shaking their hands and uh, like I'm about to sleep. This is just after lunch. I can go more slowly. And please ask questions, otherwise I'm talking to a wall. I don't want to talk to a wall. Sorry if I sound um, annoying, but I like, want to shake you guys. So let's talk about um, vial type two. So let's start with the molecular telluride we already discussed. Molecular telluride, if you grow and let it relax, it, is, it is, uh, crystallizes into a two eight phase, sort of hexagonal phase we see on from the top. This phase semiconducting with a band gap about one electron volt is just foliable. It's very interesting because it goes in direct, a direct band gap in the monolayer limit. So it has a band gap comparable to silicon. So my interest in this material is that it could perhaps create phase transformations from this to this guy. This guy is the beta molly telluride. It's a high temperature phase. You heat this guy across 650, 700 uh, Celsius you find this monoclinic phase and you can quench it very quickly and you stabilize this phase at the room temperature. In my opinion, it's a metastable phase. I have a, had long disputes with Stanford if it's metastable or not. So it's basically the same structure you have here. You rotate the bottom plane by 180 degrees and then you buckle it. That creates this 1T prime phase. And when you go to lower temperatures, it goes to the TD phase that Bernadette's group called gamma phase, and I'm having a lot, a lot of hard time from the chemist because the beta phase is the higher temperature phase, the alpha phase is the room temperature phase, the gamma phase should be an even higher temperature phase that does not exist. The gamma phase is to use, is to indicate that we have the same structure as tungsten ditelluride, which is orthorhombic. And tungsten ditelluride, we'll come back in a minute, what is it? Uh, but anyway, tungsten ditelluride, as you guys know, um, was found a few years ago to have a gigantic magnetic resistance by Kawa's group and Ong and claimed to have the largest magnetic resistance ever observed. It was published in Nature as a well um, site of the group. Tungsten telluride, like molecular telluride, were claimed to be this vial type 2 where you have the cones uh, that are perpendicular with respect to the fermi level. You tilt them and then if the fermi level is here, they're going to create hole in electron pockets that are sort of touching linearly. Here, they, pr they make very specific predictions where these things should, should touch. The same thing for tungsten ditelluride. The, the prediction is that, uh, we discussed earlier this morning, these bands will touch, would give you about four vial points in the blue zone. And the Fermi surface, as we saw before, is composed by several concentric hole in electron pockets. We already saw this. When we were working the system, um, we had several questions about what it was the appropriate crystallographic structure to do the calculations. So we measure in synchrotron the low temperature structure, the independent structure calculations, they basically do not change. So the Fermi surface is composed from many um, pockets as the structures already talked. And um, as I said, the extent telluride has a gigantic magnetic resistance. And this gigantic magnetic resistance was attributed to the fact that it's compensated, has exactly the same number of carriers and electrons. If you guys go to Pippard's book, there's an, uh, there is a, an expression for magnetic resistance that contains the number of electrons and numbers of holes, and it can be shown when they're exactly the same, you have the largest magnetic resistance. They was claimed that accidentally this material was perfectly compensated. The problem with this explanation is that there are other people that have published the whole effect of the single, and they apply pressure actually to the single superconducting, and it becomes perfectly compensated around 10 gigapascal when the whole effect really goes to zero. But when it goes to zero, it pres presumably is perfectly compensated, the gigantic magnetic resistance goes away. So it seems that it's not that simple, that co carrier compensation is the origin of the uh, large magnetic resistance. 
In 2014, there was a group from MIT that claimed, as was discussed earlier, for cardium telluride and mercury telluride, that if you, you could exfoliate uh, tungsten telluride in places between layers of boronitride, this thing would have a non-trivial Z2 invariant, as we discussed earlier. Basically, you, this system would be characterized by a quantum spin hole state, and with this counter-propagating -propagate, spin polarized edge states. So why are we interested in this quantum spin hole effect state? Can anybody tell me? No? These states are protected against dissipation. If this effect could be brought at room temperature, we found a way to integrate this with silicon technology. You could make interconnector materials like this. One of the biggest problems that we have today is heating in your computers. You guys all know about this, right? I have heard a talk not long ago, like one or two years ago, and, it, and the speaker um, was claiming that actually the dense of energy in your microprocessors are approaching the dense of energy of a nuclear reactor. I don't know if that's true or not, but I would not be surprised. So how we de decrease that? We have to find the materials that can give you behavior like superconductors at room temperature and that can, could serve as interconnect. So it's part of the interest on this thing, besides all the implications for um, spintronics. So the quantum spin hole effect was published in 2018, 2017. Pablo Hari at MIT has been leading a lot of this field. So he put tungsten telluride between layers of boronitride with a, a, lot, a lot of bottom layers and a lot of contacts. And what he sees is the contacts become very small. The conductance tends to saturate into this two times the quantum of conductance. Why he needs to go to very small layers? Because there's a lot of uh, it's very small gates. He, he needs to drive away a lot of crap. He has a lot of charged powders and other things that should not be there. And he assumes that when regions are very small, it's easier to get a more homogeneous region of the material and that would give you the quantum of Hall effect. The problem is this quantum of conductance associated with quantum Hall's uh, quantum spin hall effect only appears at below 100 Kelvin. It's not completely useful for applications yet. There are other compounds that have similar structure and uh, that perhaps can help us bring this to room temperature. One thing I would like to call your attention because many of you will use DFT is one of the big problems for experimenters like me. This is the famous surface uh, proposal by DFT, the best we could uh, get in terms of agreement with experiments. This is another paper published between, uh, before us. You can see this fermi surface has this banana that that's the brillouin zone, essentially two-dimensional character. The real fermi surface from the experiment is quite different. You have ellipsoids. Ellipsoids. Ellipsoids is 3D electronic structure, right? So you have a material that's layer that you can exfoliate on the monolayer, but the electronic structure is 3D, like the material is bulk. So I don't know if anyone understands this. And this is a recurrent problem for us to do high magnetic fields. It's possible that, some, that this is some sort of electron, in my opinion, I'm speculating wildly here, that some sort of electronic order to reconstruct the, the Fermi surface and give you this property. At this moment, there's no clear evidence for this electronic order in this material. But it's important for you, is one of the messages I want to convey, the FT does not give you all the information. It does not, does not give you all the correct information. Okay? That's why, you guys are going to discuss other methods. And this is very difficult for people like me, because ARPES always sees what the FT calculates, and we don't. It makes our life hell, okay? So, and that's another message I want to convey here. I should be politically correct, but I should tell you honestly, beware what ARPES says, or the ARPES community says. Look at the data, data very carefully. So another thing that has, was published Ooh. But by Pablo recently, is something called no linear Hall effect. Okay, this is a nature, it's just coming out, okay? It's a long paper with a lot of supplementary information just trying to brush you the, the, the ideas. What they claim is, this is by layer tungsten telluride. They don't use the term vial anywhere in the manuscript. What they say is, imagine you have a monolayer with a nearly Dirac dispersion, Spin-out coupling opens a gap. If you look to the texture of the berry phase and the conduction band, the valence band is uniform. 
a very phase with better curvature. Now you apply an electric field, you tilt the bands. As you tilt the bands, presumably you develop, that's what they say according to their calculations, a non-uniform distribution of barrier curvature. It's like you create a finite dipole of barrier curvature. The dipole of barrier curvature is like, to me, it's like you had a vial point, there's two sets of vial points. You have a net um, barrier curvature momentum, as they call it. And they make, I don't have the time to talk about this, there's this um, paper here of 2018 where they shine like infrared and they claim because of this dipolar moment they can induce currents with light. Although this material is not a, it's not a semiconducting, you're not creating a terrestrial structure, don't have a P and a junction, it's like a photovoltaic effect on a semi-metal. Okay? Here, they made bilayer graphene and they use this very simple schematics to try to convey their ideas. So imagine that now you have two vial points in each layer, you couple them, include the spin over coupling, you open a gap and they have different um, barrier curvature textures, they hybridize, and what they claim is that in each the conduction and the valence band have a net um, barrier curvature dipole. Now if you have a net curvature by dipole, what they claim is that you apply a voltage along the contact, you measure voltage along um, a whole contact without a magnetic field, okay? Without a magnetic field, you go to the second harmonic, you see a signal that's very much like a Hall response, all due to the non-trivial effects of the barrier curvature, okay? And they claim if you measure the magnetic resistance, you don't see much of a response at all. So this is a novel type of Hall effect they claim to be seen here. Hold and behold, tungsten dithylurine can also become superconducting, again from Pablo, when you gate it. You go from presumably this quantum spin hall effect state to the large density of carriers to the superconducting state. <coughs> Superconductivity emerges at relatively low temperature. So the, the fundamental question here is, can you put a set of gates where you would have stripes of superconduction connecting stripes of quantum spin hall state side by side? So you could induce superconductivity in the quantum spin hall state insulator, right? Are you guys familiar with Charlie Kane prediction of a P wave superconductivity in the surface of topological insulator? So this is a king to that prediction. And that prediction is at the heart of this existence of Meyer and Mose that could be used for quantum computing. So that's what they're after here. They're after creating zones that have superconducting areas contiguous to zones that have quantum spin hall state hoping to induce superconductivity, quantum spin hall insulator, and, and find the Majorana fermions. So, let me go quickly. To the Gamalier telluride, basically what we have was discussed by Strauss, we're going to discuss tomorrow, I will go uh, relatively quickly. So Molly dithylluride has a transition to this TD phase, we call it the gamma, some people say it's not appropriate. And uh, you can grow these things by tellurium flux, and you get triple R's that go in the order of 1,000. Triple R's means the resistance at low temperature is very tiny. There are very little impurities in scattering, very little residual resistivity. Molly telluride can be exfoliated to the monolayer. There's a former student of mine, it's not Columbia. He's working on this, he's exfoliated the monolayers, he's put this on boronite side to encapsulate it because these materials are very sensitive to air. Molly telluride does go superconducting at the relatively low temperatures. If you apply pressure, superconductivity increases in a very dramatic way. And there's some predictions already, there's nature communications that claims this a topological S plus minus state. I don't know what topological S plus minus is. For me, top S plus minus is not topological. Nevertheless, some people from Korea, there's another message I'm trying to convey here. Be careful with what you read, okay? This is a paper claiming to see opening of a gap in molyditelluride. What they see is, if you have bulk molyditelluride, as you go in temperature, the conductivity increases. It's a log scale. If you have the 2H, the conductivity goes down as it decreases temperature. And they claim you see the same in the monolayer. But it, it turns out that tungsten dithylluride, well, molyditelluride, this is a group from UPenn. They have a ground something by chemical vapor deposition. I don't want to go too much into details. Basically, they have, they achieve the high, the right phase. That's what they're trying to demonstrate in this experiment. What they find is that the molyteluride remains metallic. And encapsulated the samples that we I showed you before, not only become metallic, but they become superconducting with a TC which is much higher than what you had in the bulk. We don't know why. 
Compare this with iron selenide, where the bulk has 7 Kelvin to C, model layer 60. Well, this goes from 150 to about 7 Kelvin. Okay? It's more dramatic. Need, it's still preparing this paper. And it's metallic. So what is happening here for the students is what I, this was discussed already by a group from um, Lausanne. Basically, the bulk is metallic, and they claim when they insulate it go to the mole layer, it becomes insulated, and that's tungsten telluride. But tungsten telluride, in their opinion, because the samples were exposed to air, the, in, the insulating state is due to under localization due to non-perfect chemical stability of the tungsten telluride in the presence of humidity. So basically what I'm trying to convey is this result claiming that this thing has a quantum spin hole state is false. They did the measurements in air, their samples degraded. This is a very well cited nature physics, okay? And it's completely wrong, okay? So, talking about things that are wrong, I don't know. As soon as these predictions from model telluride came out, then came a, no, no, a, a plethora of ARPES papers where we were finishing our measurements and writing our paper about quantum oscillations, claimed to see the Fermi surfaces predicted by DFT. And they claimed to see simply more vial points that were predicted by uh, uh, the DFT calculations. They did some uh, STM in a very convoluted way. They claimed to see non-trivial Fermi arcs versus trivial Fermi arcs. This is very controversial. But basically, all the papers agree that molytelluride should be a vial type 2 and the Fermi surface is exactly the Fermi surface that DFT predicts. With the quantum oscillations measurements in samples that are extremely high quality, the best at that time in the world, we put at very low temperatures, 225, 35 millikelvin. We go to very high magnitudes, use very sensitive techniques, apply magnetic field along the C axis. We should see, as I showed you before, a very complex Fermi surface, which should give you many frequencies. We see two fundamental frequencies only, two pieces of Fermi surface. We see the second harmonic, we see the third harmonic. If you look carefully, there's the fourth harmonic. The carriers can go to one turn, two turns, three turns, four turns before they scatter. That tells me my sample is pretty damn good, but I don't see the other pieces of the Fermi surface. So we measure effective masses, we explore the angular dependence. I'm running out of time. And this is one of the messages they want to convey here. We try to start the very phase. Is this um, topological or not? So these are the Wiggles, and these are fits to lipschitz kosovitz if you take the low field apart, it fits pretty well. It gives you certain frequencies. The Vigo temperatures are not too bad. Berry phases, which are not very clear if they're topological or not. Change the field range, go to higher fields. Berry phases start changing. Vigo temperatures start changing. Frequencies start changing. It keeps going. The fits get worse and worse and, and do not capture the data. And everything keeps evolving with the field. That's the message I'm trying to convey. For certain materials with large Fermi surfaces, if you're trying to strike the Berry phase, it's probably okay to try to do this in this way. For materials like this that have a strong spin on the coupling, relatively small Fermi surface, not so small, but relatively small, the Fermi surface is affected by the Zeeman effect. Okay? This is not a good method, although it's widely used, it's not a good method to strike the Berry phase. So we did measurements of function of the angle, took the FFT, da 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 da. So, these are the frequencies that the Stratos calculated for us. That's what we should see as a, uh, according to the FT. Many, many frequencies, the large hole pockets in a bunch of electron pockets, some with 2D character diverging here. What we see is quite sm much simpler and different. More importantly, in this range of frequencies where we should see the electron pockets, they are here, but they don't seem to show two-dimensional character, and we don't see the all these large hole pockets that we should see. So we're scr scratching our heads. I mean, the Fermi surface looks much more 3D. There's no evidence for 2D whatsoever in, this, in our measurements. And of course, when you disagree with ARPES, they come back at you swigging very hard, right? There's a strong community, and there are a, lot of a bunch of papers published in face journal. But look at their data. This is the FT calculation, and this is data from this PRB, and this is data from this very well-cited PRX. 
When you look side by side, this is their bands. Look to the position of this feature, which somehow is somewhere here in the DFT. This is a fancy way of projecting the DFT bands, that they look a little bit like Arthas. Look to the insert here. This paper and this paper claim perfect agreement between DFT and Arthas. I insist, repeat, perfect agreement be between DFT and Arthas. But if you look carefully, the position of the Fermi level according to DFT should be here. What they see is the position of the Fermi level is here according to DFT. There's a difference about, I don't know, the bands are below about, I don't know, 50 milli electron volts. Same thing here. The position of this guy, the position of this guy do not match at all. There's a displacement of about 45, 50 milli electron volts. Now I ask you, if it, the bands don't match the FT, how can the Fermi surface? Can anybody tell me? Why six papers of the ARPAS community say it matches perfectly when their own data that says it doesn't? Okay? So I'm very forceful about this because it's already in the borderline of dishonesty. Okay. So struggling with this problem, um, we placed, we played with displacing ad hoc the, the, the bands to try to match. First, we use the ARPES as a guidance and we displace all the whole, the whole bands down in energy. And then we play a little bit the electron bands to try to match the experiment. Is this well justified? No. But the, the other message I want to convey to you is the following. Use VASP, use Win2K, use whatever implementation of FET you want. The Fermi level will be in different position. Please bear in mind, the FT has an inherent error bar, it's an approximation. Whatever the FT tells you has tens of milli V's in error bar. The position of the bands, the position of the Fermi level. So what we are doing is trying to correct the things, trying to sort of correct for the inherent error bars of the FT. That's what we're trying to do. So what do we get? Without spin out a couple, is a much better agreement than what we have here. If you put spin out a couple, there are many more bands. The problem is, our shifting of the bands to try to match the experience would wipe out the vial points, the crossing between bands that give a very different family surface that don't touch anymore. Is this correct? Probably not. Okay. So, the match I'm trying to say in the point of why you guys are coming here for this theory talk is DFT is not everything. And topological material is heavily based on DFT. But things like the strength of the coupling layer materials, the role of correlation is very important. It's up to you guys as a future generation to sort this out. Don't believe everything you're seeing. So Strato says that you can put correlations and get a much better agreement, and the vial points would survive. Hopefully so. So I think I will stop here and let you ask questions, because I have not had any questions. I'm already Tired of talking, so you guys ask questions. <laughs> Everything was clear, yes. Sorry? It does leave shit because of it, assume what? It doesn't take into account orbitals at all. It's a very simple quantum mechanical calculation. It doesn't start from the point, in, uh, the point of view orbitals at all. It's very generic, okay? It's not a specific to a material. It just it says, this is what a Fermi distribution does in temperature. That's what impurities do. They scatter things. And that's it's very simple quantum mechanics, okay? It's semi-classical calculations. You're welcome, and we have been all waiting in this lab for an additional different formally, but it's not available yet, okay? And so far, it has worked beautifully for most materials, including even graphene, okay? I guess it's not a good talk for an experiment, I mean, for the theorists, okay. Everybody's tired. More questions? No? Yes, thank you.
first of all, our measurements are done at 35 millikelvin. It's close enough to zero temperature, in my opinion. The Fermi service would be well uh, stabilized. But the important point that you didn't get from my message is, if you look to their own data, they cannot agree with the FT. Okay? And the amazing thing is that refers are missing this. And the community is going ahead and say, oh, everything's perfect. It's not. So there's a problem we have to understand. Maybe there's some electronic order coexisting with everything else that's reconstructed family service. We don't know. If I get things like palladium and telluride and measure the family surface, the green with the FT is perfect. It's excellent. I get the cousin, we also measure platinum and telluride. So it'll be the same thing. And then the FT does not work again very well. Why? I have no clue. So the message I'm trying to convey is for the theories and for the communities, don't take the FT as the law, right? There are limitations, and more and more advanced methods are needed, and better understanding of the materials are needed. So I'm not saying it's a fantastic tool, okay? It gives fantastic guidance, but it's not the last word. That's what I'm trying to convey here. I think everybody's already tired. Are you tired? Did you run? I have I brought my coffee. <laughs> mm. Michael, my student, made it for me. Okay, I guess everybody's tired. Let's have coffee then. 